When it comes to home servers, function should always come before form. That being said though, every now and then I like to build something that not only works well, but also looks cool. And in that category, well, this one might just take the cake. This is my first ever fully 3D printed NAS or home server enclosure. And honestly, I think the final result turned out pretty great. But don't let the cute aesthetics fool you. It's packing five hard drives for storage, three NVMe SSDs, 10 gig networking, and probably the most powerful CPU I've ever featured on this channel. It all came together really well in the end, but getting there, well, that was a bit more of a challenge, so let's talk about it. I've used 3D printing to make adapters, drive cages, fan shrouds, and more. But for a while now, I've really wanted to 3D print an entire NAS case. This is probably because I stumbled across a YouTube channel called Maker Unit, which I highly recommend. I'll have a link to it down in the description. He creates some incredible case designs, like this one here that he did most recently, which is a 12 bay full ATX NAS case. I was really tempted to print one of his designs, but felt like I might go with a bit of a safer option for my first 3D printed case, or at least what I thought would be a safer option. What I landed on was the mass from Mod Case, specifically the premium version. There is a version of the design that you can download for free, but there's also a premium version that can hold five hard drives in each bay instead of four and has some other bonus features. I saw a video from Tech by Matt where it looked like he had success with it, and one of my RAID 10 members printed one as well, so I figured spending just $30 was probably worth it, especially if it was easy to build and came with some decent instructions. The mass case can fit an ITX motherboard with a PCIe slot, and supports SFX, SFXL, and even Flex ATX power supplies. The main enclosure holds up to three 2.5 inch hard drives, and the drive bay holds five 3.5 inch drives. But if you want, you can print a second bay to hold up to 10 drives. Everything stacks together in this vertical layout, which I thought was pretty neat, so I pulled the trigger. Now, rather than just going with black or something, I wanted to pick a filament color that might stand out a bit. I had an idea to go with sort of a beige retro vibe, but the case just looked too modern for that. So I kept thinking, and well, finally it hit me. I personally love the not too a beige and brown vibe, and I'd already bought some beige filament, so I figured why not go with that? For the filament, I stumbled across this Rapid Pet G from Elegoo, which I've really come to like. Pet G is a good choice for this project because it won't warp when it gets warm like PLA might, and it's still relatively easy to print with. And this Rapid Pet G, well, as its name might suggest, can print a bit faster than standard Pet G. I actually found that I could just use the default Bamboo Lab Pet G filament settings, although I did increase the heat bed temperature just to minimize warping. This beige color is essentially identical to the beige on the Noctua fans, and for some accents, there's also a decent looking brown. Together, I think these make the perfect combination to hopefully make this case look great. Now, you know what other combination can keep you looking great? The collection of grooming products and the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra from today's sponsor, Manscaped. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra comes with a lot of great stuff, but the main feature is the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. It uses interchangeable skin safe blades, so you can swap between the trimmer blade and foil shaver. The trimmer blade comes with three different combs, giving you a good variety of lengths to choose from, but you can also swap to the foil shaver for a nice smooth finish. One of the best features of the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is the upgraded LED light, which has two different temperature settings that work well for a range of skin tones. It also comes with a bunch of quality of life features like USB-C charging, a 700 milliamp hour battery that gives you up to 60 minutes of use, and a travel lock to prevent any awkward buzzing in your luggage. There's also the Weed Whacker 2.0, which I love because, well, honestly, I get a lot of nose hairs and this thing is super fast, easy to use, and makes dealing with nose hair way less annoying. Both of these are IPX7 rated, so they're super easy to clean, and you can even use them in the shower. The kit also comes with some extra goodies for, well, your goodies, like the Crop Soother Aftershave to help with razor burn and irritation, and the Crop Preserver Deodorant to keep you feeling fresh. There's also the Shed 2.0 travel bag, but honestly, I think my favorite part of this whole package might be the Boxers 2.0. They've become my go-to underwear. I think I bought like 10 pairs at this point, and it's pretty much all I wear. So if you're looking to step up your grooming game, make sure to pick up a Performance Package 5.0 Ultra from Manscaped. And if you use my code HARDWARE15, you'll get 15% off plus free international shipping at checkout. That's 15% off plus free shipping using code HARDWARE15. The first item to print was the rear of the case, which was printed with 100% infill for extra rigidity. This makes sense as this is going to be the piece supporting the weight of the power supply. Next up was the front of the case, and here the model is actually split into two parts. That's because one of these is for the mesh front panel. And to generate the mesh, you remove all bottom and top layers as well as the perimeters, so all that's left is just the infill. And I have to say, I had never heard of this technique of using the infill patterns in the slicer to actually generate this mesh, but it's so cool, I'm obsessed. I, I kinda wanna start just designing cases so I can just print more meshy things. Sorry, I'll get back to the script. 
Next was the drive bay, which is printed in two pieces. The rear printed just fine, but the front, well, not so much. It says you don't need to add supports, but I didn't feel super confident, so I added a few supports anyway. Even with those, though, I had some bridging issues. Now, fortunately, it wasn't significant and would mostly all be hidden inside the case, but if I had gone back and done this again, I probably would have just added supports to pretty much all of it. The rest of the prints all used the same settings, and after a day or so, I had all the pieces ready to go. The beige and brown Pet&G ended up looking great, but I wasn't quite a fan of how shiny it was. Now, this is mostly just a trait of Pet-G, it seems, unless you buy, like, specific matte Pet-G, but it really makes the texture of the layer line stand out, which is very noticeable between different sections of the case. To try and help alleviate this a bit, I hit all of the visible portions of the pieces with some matte acrylic clear coat. After two fairly thick coats, the sheen was noticeably more consistent. It might be a bit tough to see on camera, but with this drive caddy, you can clearly see how much shinier the brown was before. Now, before assembling the case, we should probably talk about what hardware is going to go inside the case. For the motherboard, I considered a few different options, like maybe just an AM4 board with a 5000 series Ryzen CPU, or maybe even that ASRock N100 board I've used before, but then I remembered that Mini's forum had started making some Mini ITX boards with Ryzen Mobile APUs. I had been interested in these for a while, so I figured this might be a good chance to check one out. So I pulled the trigger on this BD795 ISE. Now really quick, because I do like to be as transparent as possible, I did reach out to Mini's forum before filming this video to see if they'd want to loan one of these boards for this project. They agreed to send one over, but I realized it was going to take a little bit longer than I'd hoped to get here, and I was really antsy to just go ahead and build the server, so I actually just bought this one on my own. Since I bought one, I asked if they wanted me to send theirs back, but they told me to keep it, so it's a little weird because I did buy this board that I'm testing, but Mini's forum also sent me one for free, so I still feel like I should note that anytime a brand sends me a product, I get to say whatever I want about it, they don't get to see this video or have any editorial control before this video goes live, but I just wanted to put that little disclaimer there. This motherboard features an AMD Ryzen 9 7945HX, which is a 16-core, 32-thread, 7000 series mobile chip. It has a boost clock of up to 5.4 GHz, and also includes AMD's Radeon 610M graphics. Rather than full-size DDR5 modules, it uses SODIMMs and can support up to 96GB, although I just used a 64GB kit. The BD795i supports two Gen 4 NVMe SSDs, and also has a Gen 5x16 PCIe slot. Plus, Mini's form included bifurcation support, so you could use something like this quad NVMe adapter for up to six SSDs. The rear I.O. is pretty simple, with a few USB ports and display outputs, as well as a 2.5 gigabit NIC. Now one thing you might have noticed that this board doesn't have is SATA ports, which is good to have if you're building a NAS. To fix this, I ordered a 6-port SATA to PCIe adapter that uses the Asmedia ASM1166 controller, but for some reason, Amazon sent me this other random card with a different controller that only has 4 ports. Fortunately, I also have an M.2 ASM1166 adapter that should work instead. The CPU cooler doesn't come with a fan of its own, and instead has this 120mm bracket. And obviously to stick with the color scheme, I went with this one from Noctua. Now I did go with a slim model just because I wasn't sure quite how much clearance I would have between the CPU cooler and the case, but later on I figured out I could have just gone with a standard fan. Since the SATA adapter was taking up one of our two NVMe sockets, and this video was turning into sort of a try out everything I've been wanting to try out for a while situation, I decided to pick up one of these cards from QNAP. This not only has an RJ45 10 gig NIC, but also has two NVMe sockets, although they only support PCIe Gen 3. Now this card is pretty expensive, but that's partially because it has a PLX chip, so it doesn't require PCIe bifurcation. To power everything, I also picked up this 750 watt power supply from Silverstone, which is definitely overkill, but could be helpful for me to have for future projects. It's also fully modular, which you'll definitely want for this case. I tested all the components out before putting them in the case, but I also wanted to check out that motherboard a bit, and when it comes to CPU performance, man, this thing is pretty nuts. In Cinebench R23, it managed multi and single-threaded scores of 30,751 and 1953, respectively. The single-threaded performance is slightly worse than another Mini's Forum Mini PC with a newer Ryzen 9 HX370, but with its 16 cores, the multi-threaded performance was significantly better than anything else I've tested on this channel. Now, to be fair, I don't really test out a ton of high-end hardware, but still, if this had some SATA ports and 10 gig networking, I'd probably just replace my editing PC with it. If all you need is a GPU and a couple of SSDs, and you don't need a bunch of SATA ports or other I.O., this could be a really powerful but inexpensive desktop motherboard. Now, when it comes to power draw, the board is pretty efficient under load, drawing 111 watts while running Cinebench R23 multi-threaded. Now, 111 watts isn't nothing, but once again, this thing absolutely smoked anything else I've ever tested in this multi-threaded benchmark. The idle power draw on Windows was less than stellar though, with the system pulling around 20 watts from the wall. 
Now for the actual server build, I was going to run Proxmox, so I went ahead and installed that. And after running PowerTop Autotune and Auto ASPM, the idle system power only dropped to around 17 to 18 watts. And interestingly, unplugging the display actually made the idle power drop slightly worse. So to get the best idle power draw, you might actually need to like plug in an HDMI dummy plug or something. That was a little odd. Now, when it comes to power draw, I've definitely seen worse even from modern hardware. But I'm curious if there are any firmware tweaks that could be made from Mini's form to help this board be a little bit more efficient. With the CPU specs, 2.5 gig networking, and especially the PCI bifurcation, this could make for a very little impressive server board, but the idle power draw is a bit of a bummer. All right, so that's it for the components. Now it was time to get the case assembled. I started by attaching the two halves of the drive bay together with some M3 by 20 screws, which is conveniently the only screw type you need for assembling this case. I also picked up some of these long torx bits to make the process a bit easier. After that, I assembled the four pieces of the main compartment of the case, as well as this little bracket for the PCIe slot. Once you have that assembled, you can snap in these little clips that hold on the mesh side panels. When it comes to the actual assembly of the case, the instructions are a bit vague. There isn't a specific order to things, it just has these various diagrams of how the things are all assembled. I figured it might make sense to go ahead and install the motherboard and power supply now while the case was nice and open, but that might have been a mistake. Now in the instructions, it says to use standard number 632 screws to attach the motherboard, but I didn't want the plastic holes to strip out. On the back, I noticed that there's these hexagonal cutouts that I thought might be so you could use some standard motherboard standoffs and sort of use them as like a nut, but it turns out the holes were a little bit too big for that. However, I did find that it fits perfectly with some standard M3 nuts, so I just used those along with some M3 bolts to attach the motherboard. That way I could tighten it down snug without having to worry about anything stripping out. Next, I attached the power supply using just standard screws, and then popped out this hole for a 16mm power button. Routing the power supply cables was a bit tricky, but I eventually got everything plugged in, and I also slid in a 140mm fan into this compartment on the drive bay. Once that was in, I used four more screws to attach the main compartment to the drive bay, but that was a little tough since I had already installed the power supply. It probably would have been better to assemble the entire case first before trying to add any of the components, but I eventually got it together. After that, I flipped it over and screwed in the base, and then I also attached these four little feet that I printed in a more flexible TPU filament. And I almost forgot to pop this little cover on to keep the fan in place. On the top of the case, I added in this fan module along with a second 140mm fan. But I messed up and didn't realize that I had to attach the very top of the case to the fan module first, so I had to take it all apart and do it again, which was pretty annoying. But with that done, it was time to add some hard drives. For drives, I used these 4TB Western Digital drives that I often use for testing, and I attached those to the caddies with some standard screws. Now for these caddies, I probably should have used TPU rather than PETG to help with vibrations, but I really wanted the caddies to match the rest of the case. All the drives just slid in and are held in place with this bracket that snaps in using more of those clips. You can use some optional thumb screws to hold it into place, but realistically you just have to use a screwdriver anyway. There's also a little handle that goes on as well, which makes the bottom of the case look like a goofy little face that, well, now you can't unsee. I ran some bundled SATA cables down from the controller to the drives, but had trouble plugging in the rightmost drive because the connector was right up against the wall of the case. I thought maybe I'd put the drives in the wrong orientation, but after pulling them all out, I realized that I had it correct, so I ended up just having to find a different SATA cable that had the correct orientation to just barely fit in there. After a bit more cable management, I also dropped in two NVMe SSDs to the QNAP card and plugged it back in. And after that, it was time to see if everything actually worked. It didn't. But that was just because I accidentally had the power button plugged into the wrong pins, so after fixing that... Oh, power supply. Oh! Okay, attempt number three. Hey! Once I got into Proxmox, I could see that all of the drives and PCIe devices were recognized, and everything seemed to be working great. And if it weren't for the tiny fan on the QNAP card, the system would essentially be dead silent, and I think it looked stunning. Well, maybe except for that awkward gap on the front where you can see the SATA cable, but I'll talk more about my issues with this case here in a minute. In Proxmox, I set up the two extra NVMe SSDs and a ZFS mirror, and then I set up a VM for TrueNAS where I passed through the 10 gig NIC and the SATA controller. Everything worked as expected, and I was able to create a pool and SMB share. Back in Proxmox, I also set up a variety of LXCs and VMs, which the system handled with no problem thanks to the 32 threads and 64 gigs of RAM. In Jellyfin, I was able to use VA API to get hardware accelerated transcoding working with the Radeon 610M graphics. Although to get tone mapping working, I had to manually install OpenCL. The transcoding performance wasn't incredible, but it was still serviceable for some 4K HDR movies. 
Obviously adding in the SATA controller PCIe card and five hard drives was going to bring the idle power draw up, but it was a bit of a bummer to see that the entire system was now drawing around 65 watts or so. Still, with how much you could do with just this single home server, that might not be too bad. Overall, I'm really happy with how this project turned out. I have a powerful, capable, and nearly silent home server, and I think it looks really stinking cool at the same time. There are a few things I might have done differently if I were to do this again though. First, I would have assembled as much of the case as I could before adding in any components. That being said, you can't really do that because, well for example, you have to insert the fan into the fan module thing before attaching it to the case. I also would have printed a different front cover. I actually didn't need those 2.5-inch drives, and there's an included variant that doesn't have any of those 2.5-inch slots, which would have been much nicer for cable management. I also think things might have been easier if I just chose a different motherboard. This mini forum system is cool, but the M.2 placement doesn't really work well with this case, and the SATA controller I used. It's really tricky trying to get up to those SATA ports, and because those M.2s are attached with little plastic plugs rather than screws, I actually had the SATA controller pop out once, and it took like 20 minutes to finally get it back into place. I think using a motherboard with SATA ports down at the bottom, or using a SATA controller in the PCIe slot, would make cabling much easier. Also, making sure that I had SATA cables that were the correct orientation for that rightmost drive would have been very helpful. I think this mass case is pretty cool, but there are definitely a few things that I wish were different. First of all, this gap on the cable cover is just really awkward. I think if the little cutout were on the panel itself, that would be better as you could just flip the cover into whichever orientation you want. I also wish there was a way to remove that fan module or just the top of the case in general to make cable management a bit easier. It's really tricky trying to work in the top of the case without completely unscrewing everything to remove the top, which is kind of a pain. I also wish, even if it meant that the case was slightly bigger, that the front panel could snap off in the same way that the side panels do, once again to make cable management easier. I feel like this would probably require a redesign of the entire case, but I think it would make a huge difference. And that's not just because I found these snappy side panels to be very satisfying. Lastly, I would have appreciated some slightly more detailed instructions, especially when it comes to the order of assembly, such as when to actually insert the fan into that fan module. Overall though, I think it's a pretty cool case, and I love the idea that, assuming you have enough SATA ports, you could just print a second drive bay if you ever wanted to add five more drives. Obviously, you need a 3D printer to make this, and those aren't free, but with the two spools of filament I purchased, as well as the power button and screws, the entire cost of this case was right around $54. Well, plus another $30 for the design, but still, that's quite a bit cheaper than what you would pay for just about any other ITX 5 bay NAS case. Plus, it was just a lot of fun to make. I'll definitely be doing some more 3D printing cases in the future, but I think I'll probably check out one of the designs from Maker Unit. Seriously guys, his channel is so good, go check it out. I'm also glad that I took a look at that Mini Swarm motherboard. Honestly, for me, the CPU is a bit overkill for what I need in my home lab, and I'd prefer something that consumes a little bit less power. But if you need that amount of horsepower in a compact server, or if you just want a compact desktop or workstation, this thing is pretty cool. If you're interested in one, or the QNAP card, or anything else I used in this video, I'll make sure to have some affiliate links down in the description, which help out the channel. Although it was a challenge at times, I really enjoyed this project, and I hope you guys did as well. If so, maybe consider giving this video a like, or subscribing to see more videos. Also, do you hate ads? Well, I have good news for you. For just a dollar a month, you can become a raid member and get early access to all of my videos without any ads, which I think is a pretty good deal. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.